Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 745 for December 16th, 2018. Coming up in a few minutes. The first thing that really jumped out at me was the name, um, which at that point I had no context uh, around. And so, but was intrigued by the name. And so started digging a little bit deeper and then quickly kind of unearthed a uh, kind of treasure trove of old historical articles and ads and bottles and just then, and really started seeing kind of how significant the brand was back in the 19th century. And Hardly a week goes by that we don't hear about a new whiskey brand that's popping up because of the global boom in whiskey sales. But Monte Antilla went in the opposite direction. He searched out heritage whiskey brands to find one with a history that could be used in a modern revival. And he found one, Chicken Cock Whiskey. It's a name that's bound to get some attention, And when your brand has to compete with dozens of others to catch the eye of a consumer on a crowded store shelf, well, you'll take any advantage you can get. There is a history behind the Chicken Cock brand, and we'll talk with Monty Antilla about it, along with the process of reviving a brand that's been lost to history on Whiskey Cast in Depth. That's coming up later, along with the calendar of events, your voice, and in the What I'm Tasting This Week department, some whiskeys that you'll have to know just the right person to talk to to get your hands on a bottle. It's all ahead on this edition of Whiskey Cast. Whiskey Cast, brought to you by Redbreast, the definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, no Redbreast. This is whiskey, Johnny Walker's Scotch whiskey. From this place and these people, I, Scotch Makers, creating the bold and complex flavour of Johnny Walker Black Label. Step right up. As always, let's start off with the news. It's brought to you by Highland Park. Remember the classic line from the movie Jaws? We're going to need a bigger boat. Well, there's a line that might have made the rounds at Diageo's North American offices recently. We're going to need a bigger distillery. In fact, they're going to need a whole new distillery in Kentucky just to meet projected demand for bourbon and other American whiskeys in the future. Diageo announced Thursday that it will spend around $130 million to build its second large-scale distillery in Kentucky, about 18 months after it opened the Bullet Distilling Company Distillery in Shelbyville. That distillery opened with enough capacity to produce about 1.8 million proof gallons of whiskey each year, and will eventually double that over time. However, the new distillery to be built in Lebanon will start with an annual capacity of around 10 million proof gallons, And a Diageo spokesperson confirmed in an email this week that it will be able to produce whiskey for Bullet, along with Blade and Bow, I.W. Harper, and most of Diageo's other bourbon and American whiskey brands, along with others yet to be created. The one exception is George Dickel Tennessee Whiskey, which will continue to be distilled at the Cascade Hollow Distillery in Tullahoma, Tennessee. The announcement came after Kentucky's Economic Development Finance Authority approved a $2.5 million incentive package for the project Thursday morning, based on Diageo's plans to create 30 new full-time jobs at the distillery. Diageo declined to make company executives available for an interview. The timetable, though, calls for the real estate deal to close next month, and assuming planning permission goes smoothly, Construction should begin in early summer with the distillery to start production in 2021. It will be Diageo's third distillery in Kentucky. In addition to the Bullet Distillery in Shelbyville, there is a small micro distillery at the Stitzel Weller Distillery Complex in Louisville that is part of what's now known as the Bullet Frontier Whiskey Experience. Work is continuing this winter on the new visitor's center at the Bullet Distillery, 
and when it opens next summer, the current center will be rebranded the Stitz Old Weller Whiskey Experience and focus on Diageo's other bourbon and American whiskey brands. Earlier this month, the U.S. Treasury Department's Tax and Trade Bureau opened a public comment period on the agency's proposal for a major rewrite of federal regulations on labeling and definitions for whiskeys and other distilled spirits, along with beer and wine. While there have been many, many minor changes over the years, this proposal would actually be the first major update to those regulations since 1935, when they were enacted to implement the Federal Alcohol Act following the end of Prohibition. We have covered a lot of the proposed changes at WhiskeyCast.com, along with providing a downloadable copy of the TTB's actual proposal, highlighted to show the whiskey-specific parts. But there is one proposal that did not make the TTB's list, a standard definition for American single malt whiskeys or single malts of any type. More than 80 U.S. distilleries formed the American Single Malt Whiskey Commission in 2016 to lobby specifically for that change. Steve Hawley of Westland Distillery in Seattle is the commission's spokesman. Of course, we are disappointed, very disappointed, um, and a little surprised, frankly. Uh, we've worked very hard to petition for our standard of identity and met uh, directly with the TTB and, and had uh, a good response from them and, and folks outside of the TTB office as well. So um, we're certainly surprised. I think that surprise was a bit tempered uh, once we saw that other things that we expected to be in there were left out as well. So surprised, disappointed, yeah, absolutely. You mentioned other things that were left out. What other things were left out that you had expected to see? Oh, there's a number of things, anything from barrel-aged gin, which I know has been uh, a popular proposal in recent years, to the elimination of uh, size formats. So a number of things across the board that we expected to see in there because we saw other people lobbying and petitioning for those things as well. Uh, what does it mean for moving forward? I'm, frankly, Mark, I think this is really just where we have to exercise a little patience. We're practiced in doing that as whiskey makers. Uh, there's a process uh, that is being followed, and we're not obviously privy to how that process is managed, um, but the reality is we're in the middle of the process still. Uh, we just started a public comment period that goes till the end of March, and we've been told and believe that there's still an opportunity for us to petition the TTB and to get our standard of identity included in what ultimately is published. Yes, I know that they did say that there were some things that were, because of their complexity, they were going to handle separately. And I, I would assume the single malt thing is part of that, because I know there are also importers that would like to have a single malt category too. Absolutely. Look, I hope they they are open and interested in dealing with things separately. That's fine by us. Um, whether it's included in this or done separately, like Cachaca was a few years ago, as, as long as it gets done, we're happy. And look, I feel for the TTB. It is complex. It was what they did publish, which, again, is short of a number of things that a lot of people were expecting, is still, what, 152 pages long? So... Um, it's a lot for them to parse through, and if they feel the best way to do this is to separate things out and take them um, ad hoc, we're certainly happy to participate. One thing with our proposed definition is it's not all that complex when you think of what single malt means around the world, and there has yet to be any real um, opposition to what we're suggesting the standard of identity should be for single malt whiskey in America. So um, I would hope that people would see that this is clear and, and obvious and something that everybody in, in the industry is in support of. The commission's proposal would use almost all of the same standards that define single malt whiskeys in Scotland. 100% malted barley from a single distillery matured in oak barrels no larger than 700 liters and bottled at a minimum of 40% ABV. The two differences between Scotland and the U.S. 
U.S. whiskeys would have no minimum aging requirement, and the whiskeys would have to come off the still at no more than 80% ABV. Scotland has no set limit for distilling strength, and, of course, requires a minimum of three years of maturation for all whiskeys. The TTB's public comment period ends on March 26th of 2019. Once again, you'll find more details on the proposed changes in the news section at whiskeycast.com. One note now from the investment world. Pernod Ricard's management is facing a challenge from an activist hedge fund. New York-based Elliott Management has built up a billion-dollar stake in Pernod Ricard, that amounts to about 2.5% of the French company's outstanding shares. Elliott wants Pernod Ricard to strengthen its profit margins by cutting costs and selling off underperforming brands. And according to the Wall Street Journal, wants the company to bring in more executives and directors from outside France. The Pernod and Ricard families control around 15% of the company's shares, along with 25% of its voting rights. And that's just one of the factors that analysts see as making it unlikely that Elliott could force Pernod Ricard to sell itself off. Elliott management acquired the British bookstore chain Waterstones earlier this year and has launched similar attacks on Samsung, Vivendi, and Australia's BHP in the past. In other news, Scotland's Glengoyne Distillery had an unexpectedly strong response this week when it put tickets on sale for a special private day at the distillery on February 16th. The 36 tickets available to members of the Glengoyne Family Affinity Group sold out in less than 24 hours. Gordon Dundas of Ian McLeod Distillers suspects more than a few tickets were bought as holiday gifts. We're going to have John Glass there, who's our master blender. We'll have Robbie Hughes, who's our group distillation director. I'll be there as well. We'll be talking wood. We'll be talking spirit. We'll be talking all the things that I think makes Glengoyne a little bit different. Um, and uh, and really just opening it up to the, the family members. So it's something which um, we've worked on for a while. And, and it's going to be the first of our, our sort of um, series of events coming up for, for family members. So we're very excited about it. And um it's something just a little bit different, and uh, that's what we want to do at Glengoyne. Do you think you might add a second or third session, given that these uh, sold out really quickly? We may well do. I mean, I think we, we you know, we, we we may well do. Um, uh, we're not sure exactly how that'll look, but uh, you know, at the moment it's sold out. But uh, we may be able to up the capacity a little bit, but or we may do another day in it, you know, six months' time or whatever. Maybe do two or three a year, but. That's all up for discussion, but certainly um, we're really excited that it's been so well received. Uh, I think a few people have bought some some other people some Christmas gifts, which is great, and it's a unique day where they're going to really get under the skin of Glengoyne. Those tickets also include a bottle of the next Glengoyne single malt to be released later in 2019. We'll let you know if they open up additional spots for the day. Turning to other new whiskeys now, there are not just one, but Two new bottlings of Booker's Bourbon out now. The big one is the Booker's 30th Anniversary Edition, and Fred No says he and his son Freddie No couldn't have just done something ordinary for that 30th Anniversary Edition. We had some 16-year-old barrels that we laid back that tasted great, but I didn't wasn't real crazy about the nose. When I started smelling this batch. I was a little suspect, thinking maybe I was being too hard on the barrels. And he happened to walk in the office. I said, smell this sample of liquor. I didn't tell him what it was or anything about it. What do you think? He said, it's kind of flat, Dad. What do you mean? He said, well, it doesn't have much of a nose. I said, well, taste it. He tasted it. He said, oh, tastes great, but it doesn't have much of a nose. I said, well, I'm glad you agree with me because that's what I was thinking too. So it was kind of cool to know that our collaboration together on that part, we agreed. And so we, uh, knowing what it was after that, he said, we've got to do something. So that's why we looked to uh, change it a little bit. So we blended in some uh, nine-year-old Booker's barrels that we had to give it a little more uh, nose that I know Dad would have 
really appreciate it with the big vanilla notes. I think sometimes I get a little hard on the product, especially the ones that bear Dad's name. Since before he passed away, he asked me to take care of the bookers, and so I told him I would, so I make sure that every batch of bookers is as special as it can be. And we actually, to make it even more special, we recycled some wood out of the warehouses that Dad liked to age the bookers in, these nine-story houses right here close to the office. And we used that reclaimed wood to actually build the boxes that the bottles are packed in. So it was a, uh, you know, there's a possibility you could get a box with wood in it that Dad actually walked on and possibly even Jim Beam if, you know, luck would have it that way. So that made it pretty cool. The Booker's 30th Anniversary Edition is available in limited quantities with a recommended retail price of around $200 a bottle. There's also the fourth and final batch of Booker's for 2018. This one is nicknamed Kitchen Table after the heirloom table that was handed down from Colonel Jim Beam. Booker now used it with guests to help select barrels of Booker's back when he was alive. And Fred Nose family still uses it today. It's available for around $70 a bottle. I'll have tasting notes for both editions soon at whiskeycast.com. And we'll hear more from Fred No later on, too. Other new whiskeys announced this week. The McAllen is releasing a new 52-year-old single cask bottling. It comes from a sherry-seasoned European oak cask that produced just 250 bottles. The price tag, 38,500 pounds each. That's around $48,500 in the U.S. Ballantines has released the new 21-year-old Warming Spices edition into global travel retail. It made its debut at Seoul's Incheon Airport last month and was blended to emphasize the spices that naturally developed in the blend's component whiskeys. The recommended retail price is around $150 U.S. a bottle. A couple of weeks ago, we heard from musician and three-chord bourbon founder Neil Giraldo during Whiskey Cast In Depth. I mentioned their plans to release a 12-year-old bourbon in that episode to go along with the regular three-chord bourbon. Well, the 12-bar barrel-proof edition is now available in New York State, and there are also plans to release a new three-chord Amplify Rye in early 2019. Kings County Distillery in Brooklyn, New York, unveiled this weekend what it's calling the first-ever peated rye whiskey from an American distillery. It's made from 80% New York-grown rye and 20% peated malt and matured for a year. It's on sale exclusively at the distillery's tasting room for $55 a bottle while it lasts. And we should note that Kings County just barely earned that title. When I was in Pittsburgh for our charity tasting a couple of weeks ago, the folks from Liberty Pole Spirits in Washington, Pennsylvania, sent along a sample of their new peated rye to go along with their peated bourbon that we tasted that night. That rye is scheduled to come out next month. I'll have my tasting notes for it soon at the website. And speaking of unusual whiskeys, Bushmills has released a new Acacia-finished whiskey that's available exclusively at the distillery in Northern Ireland. The whiskey is a blend of ex-bourbon and sherry casks that's finished for a year in Acacia wood. It sells for 74 pounds, around $93 U.S. a bottle, and once again, it's only available at the Bushmills Distillery Store. Elsewhere in finishes, Tullibardine has released the latest edition in its Marques collection, the Murray Marsala finish. It's the fourth release in the series and comes from whiskey distilled back in 2006 and matured in first fill ex-bourbon barrels, then finished for a year in Sicilian Marsala wine casks. There's no word on pricing. Single Cask Nation is out with a new 12-year-old blended malt scotch whiskey. And yes, even though it is a blend, it is still a single cask. 
The malts came from various unnamed Edrington distilleries that were batted together as New Make Spirit back in 2006 and filled into a first fill Oloroso Sherry Hogshead at the time. It's bottled at 59.6% ABV and sells for $130 a bottle. Finally, Douglas Lang & Company is winding up its 70th anniversary celebrations in 2018 with two new releases. The Big Pete Platinum Edition 26-year-old Isla Blended Malt and the Extra Old Particular, or XOP, Platinum Port Ellen 1982 Vintage Single Cask. Only 273 bottles of that Port Ellen will be available in the UK, Europe, and Asia. The recommended retail price, £1,950. That's about $2,450 U.S. 3,000 bottles of the Big Pete Platinum Edition will be available in those same markets for around £175 each. That's about $220 a bottle. You can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. The news is brought to you by Highland Park, the Orkney single malt with Viking Soul. If you want to give a gift that makes an impression, why not give that special person a bottle of Highland Park's classic 18-year-old? It's been regarded for years now as one of the world's best whiskeys, and it's one they won't even think of returning. Find out more at highlandparkwhiskey.com. Time now for the Whiskey Cast calendar of events. There's a tasting of Bob Dylan's Heaven's Door whiskeys at the Lost Property Bar in Los Angeles, California this Wednesday night, December 19th. Dylan will not be on hand. Julio's Liquors in Westboro, Massachusetts has a compass box tasting that same night. The Scotch Whiskey Experience in Edinburgh, Scotland, has a White and Mackay tasting coming up on Thursday, the 20th. Catoctin Creek Distillery in Purcellville, Virginia, is one of the hosts for Whimsy and Wonder on New Year's Eve. After the holidays, the San Antonio Cocktail Conference runs from January 14th through the 20th in San Antonio, Texas. I'll be in Victoria, British Columbia, for the annual Victoria Whiskey Festival, January 17th through the 20th. And, of course, we'll have special coverage again this year from Victoria on WhiskeyCast. The D.C. Scotch Walk is January 19th in Washington, D.C. And the Kentucky Derby Museum in Louisville kicks off its annual Bourbon Legends series with the folks from Michter's January 24th. Right now, we have 145 different events around the world on our searchable calendar at whiskeycast.com. If you have a festival, tasting, or any other whiskey-related event coming up, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to let us know about it, and we'll add it to the list. This is Whiskey. Johnny Walker's Scotch Whiskey. From this place, and these places in that place. These are the people that make it. Aging in Oak for 12 long years. See, the land that shapes these people and the people that shape this whiskey all shape how bloody good it tastes. Bold as it is complex. For every step you take, this is Johnny Walker Black Label, friends. Step right up. Can I drink this now? Johnny Walker Black Label Blended Scotch Whiskey. 40% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Lagavulin. The bourbon boom has brought with it renewed interest in historic pre Prohibition era whiskeys and the stories behind them. The other day, Christie's put a rare collection of pre Prohibition American whiskeys on the auction block in New York City. A 12 bottle case of Overholt Rye whiskey from 1905 sold for $31,850 while 10 different lots of Hermitage 9-year-old bottled and bond rye whiskey from back in 1914 went for a collective total of more than $200,000. Now, Overholt is still with us today, though it's made by Beam Suntory in Kentucky, 
instead of the Overholt family in Pennsylvania, while Hermitage is one of the many brands that largely disappeared after Prohibition. Chicken Cock is another one of those heritage brands. James Miller started making it in Paris, Kentucky back in 1856. When Prohibition took effect in 1920, the brand was sold to Montreal's Distillers Corporation Limited. In fact, a bottle of chicken cock rye from that era was part of the Christie's auction. It was part of a three-bottle lot that also included a bottle of 1913-era W.H. McBrayer's Handmade Sour Mash Whiskey and a vintage bottle of Teacher's Highland Cream Blended Scotch. None of the three bottles were anywhere close to good condition, but the winning bid was $4,900, more than three times the pre-auction estimate. The Chicken Cock brand itself was revived late last year by Monte Antilla's Grain and Barrel Spirits with an eight-year-old single-barrel bourbon, and this October, a ten-year-old double-barrel bourbon. But why? That's the question I asked Monty when we talked recently. I've been in the spirit space for now, I guess, about 13 years. Um, and um, one of the brands that I'd owned previously and, and subsequently sold was Boodle's Gin. Famous old gin brand, dates back to the 19th century, um, reputed to be Winston Churchill's favorite gin. He did drink a lot of it, especially in the kind of post-World War II years. And... While I owned that brand, um, I had started looking at other categories in which legacy and heritage really mattered. Um, and with this idea of finding old brands uh, that had kind of faded, you know, from their kind of previous glory, um, and and revive them. And so, um, you know, at the time I owned Boodles, I mean, it had been a hundred thousand plus case brand, kind of into the um, early 80s and then had kind of slowly died off and I acquired it from Pernod Ricard and was in the middle of kind of resurrecting that brand. And um, I'd always been interested in the American whiskey category, especially as it pertained to these older brands and um, you with Prohibition uh, wiping out so many brands. Uh, there are a lot of brands out there that, that have been, um, you know, significant especially in the 19th century and pre-prohibition, uh, that were no longer around. So I started doing uh, some research into the early days of distilling in the United States, and, and I came across Chicken Cock. And the first thing that really jumped out at me was the name, um, which at that point I had no context uh, around, and so, but was intrigued by the name, and so started digging a little bit deeper and then quickly kind of unearthed a uh, kind of treasure trove of old historical articles and ads and bottles and just been, and really started seeing kind of how significant the brand was back in the 19th century. And then the real um, element that really got me excited about it was the its prohibition history um, around the Cotton Club. And, um, you know, reading um, Duke Ellington's memoirs where he talks about chicken cock and and, you know, and as I kind of got into more and more of the research, for example, going to the Oscar Getz in, in Bardstown and finding a lot of pre-prohibition um, chicken cock bottles and advertisements, it just had a lot of elements to it that I look at and say, okay, this is a brand that you can really kind of rebuild the story around kind of a really uh, rich, rich legacy uh so and that was really the inspiration for, for bringing back because very, very few brands have such an interesting story as, as Chicken Cock. And so the opportunity to kind of bring something like that back is pretty unique. What does it take to bring back a brand like this that uh, has pretty much died out? Yeah, so from a logistics standpoint, I mean, it was, uh, you know, it basically was a dead trademark. So, um, you know, ownership in the United States from a trademark standpoint and IP standpoint is really based around use. So the fact that no one had um, renewed the mark and used the mark for, for decades meant it was basically out there for, you know, anyone to claim it, which is, which is what we did. So, you know, that part of it was, was fairly simple, but I think the process of bringing back a brand, it's, 
you know, partially it is paying homage to that kind of the heritage and history of it, but also doing it in a way that makes it relevant for today and today's consumer, right? Um, and if you look at um, the brand itself and the, and the kind of historical brand, it went through many iterations. I mean, it was, you know, a Kentucky bourbon, then it then during Prohibition, a lot of the production was up in Canada, and that was ultimately what was smuggled in. And then post-World War II, when there was a lot of, uh, and really post-Prohibition, when there was a lot of um, kind of bulk bourbon out there, it became a kind of a, a blended bourbon, a blended whiskey. And so, you know, it's trying to look at it in, in, from a modern standpoint and say, okay, how do we bring back that, the kind of the, the legacy and the heritage of the brand while whether it's from a liquid standpoint or production standpoint, kind of putting our own spin on it. And one of the key things that we had with the brand was we had a lot of, uh, a lot of historical packaging. And so we were able to take some of the bottles, um, kind of prohibition and before, and take those bottles to our glass makers and, and have the molds recreated. And so that part of the core, especially around our single barrel and now our double barrel, um, that are out in market was was bringing back the kind of that old medicinal style bottle that was a direct inspiration from a bottle that we had found um, actually at at the Oscar Getz. So that's the kind of the key process of bringing back these brands is is saying okay we're going to take pieces of the history that really kind of pay homage to kind of what our predecessors did, but also then look at and say, you know, how do we kind of adapt it for, you know, today's market? You know, one of the challenging things in, in bourbon in particular, especially over the last couple of years has been just access to, you know, access to supply. Um, So that's been a process for us in terms of while we kind of lay down our own whiskey, that is ultimately going to be, ready in a couple of years, you know, we've also been very active in the market in terms of, of finding really unique barrels so we could do the limited limited releases. And that's kind of been our process of kind of putting our spin on it. It's like, how do we put all this together from a liquid standpoint while taking advantage of some of the historical, um, you know, packaging that's out there? Society has changed a lot in the decades since chicken cock was popular. Mm-hmm. And the demographics of the whiskey drinker have changed, most certainly. So how do you bring this brand to relevance in the 2010s and into the 2020s for an audience that doesn't know what the legacy of the brand was? Uh, I have to admit sure. that if you uh, tell somebody that you're going to do a story about chicken cock, you get some rolled eyes these days because of that name. So how do you bring it around and uh, tell this story and overcome some of the uh, issues that come with a name like that? Yeah, so, um, you know, so the name is definitely an attention grabber, um, which um, we view as as a positive, especially then it kind of opens up the conversation around kind of what is the legacy of the brand um, and where does the name come from? I mean, so... You know, I get the question all the time of how did we name it chicken cock? Because obviously we, we didn't name it chicken cock. Someone did back in 1856, right? And, you know, if you look at the, I mean, on its own, the term cock is just a male bird, right? So woodcock, game cock, and still used um, prevalently in, in England as an example. All the birds, male birds, there are cocks. So, you, you know, all chicken cock was when when the brand was, was first started was, was a rooster, what we would now call a rooster. Uh, which was a term that didn't come into to being really until the late 19th century by American farmers. And so, but it's it's a conversation starter without a doubt. I think that what we've been able to do, the most valuable thing for us has been social media. So we have over 100,000 Facebook followers for the brand. Um, and that has been a uh, extremely valuable tool in in communicating the brand's history um, as well as what we're doing today. Um, and it's such a uh, conversation starter um, around the name and the legacy that, that has this amazing kind of virality to it um, that is very conducive to, to, to social media, um, whether it's Facebook or Instagram or any of these, 
these medians, which has allowed us to tap into a kind of an evolving, you know, whiskey consumer. I mean, our, our, our core demographic from a sales standpoint still tends to be, you know, slightly kind of older male, I think a large part because of the price points of our limited releases. Um, but if you look at our broader audience, um, it is it is a fairly diverse group, age uh, demographics, you know, gender, and so, um, and a lot of people discover the brand initially because of the name, and then and they're intrigued, and then you know that opens the door to a deeper conversation around kind of the brand's legacy. And, and that's what really kind of hooks people, right? So it's it's the story of of prohibition in the Cotton Club. It's the story of you know the brand's founding in Paris, Kentucky. Um, and then uh, you know when we tell people about well, what is a chicken cock, right? It's then the fact that it's just a it's a rooster. You know that's a that's something that then they can kind of go and share share to others. And so it's. Um, it, it has like the story around it kind of really helps kind of get people engaged. Um, and then I think from a packaging standpoint, um, it's just a beautiful bottle that, you know, people love to have on their, on their bar. Um, and based on the bottle and the name, it's, you know, it's, it's definitely an attention grabber and, you know, in a crowded marketplace, uh, you want to put something out there that is going to grab people's attention and not be lost in the shuffle. And, and I think the brand and, and its success today is is a result of having multiple elements to it that, that do grab attention, and including the name. But how do you get around that little problem of uh, Internet web filters in uh, certain offices and uh, certain computers that uh, are going to see part of that name and they're going to go, uh-uh, this is a blocked site? You know, we actually haven't found <laughs> that to be an issue too much. Um, I think if you look at, uh, you know, if you take like cocktail, the word, and um, you know, there's other <laughs> other things that have, have the term cock in it. Um, yeah, that actually hasn't been too much of an issue. I think when we get hit by um, spam filters or, or block website, it tends to be more about around the alcohol piece versus the name. But um but yeah, hasn't hasn't been too much of a too much of a barrier so far. I'll admit that our own website gets blocked a few times on alcohol issues as yeah. well. So yeah, I know that, the feeling. that happens regularly. I mean, and that's you know a lot of offices and stuff like that. That'll that'll definitely be the case. Now you've talked about laying down your own spirit. You're not building a distillery though. You're working with uh, Steve Nally and uh, mm-hmm. John and the folks at Bardstown Bourbon Company to actually lay down your spirit for the future, right? Correct. We've been laying down um, products for actually the last couple of years. Most recently, we've become part of the Collaborative Distillers Program at BBC. You know, I've known David Mandel um, over there, uh, the CEO of, of Bardstown, uh, for a number of years since we, from really back in the day when we both got into the spirits industry. So, you know, I've kind of watched what they've done. Um, and as they've, you know, built a distillery and, and the overall experience and had had conversations with them about, you know, how do we kind of go back in the kind of in the vault? And it really fit well with, with our model. Um, you know, our goal was never really to build our own distillery, but instead to work with kind of the best in, best in class on the production side, um, to, to really develop out our brand. And, you know, one of the, the nice things that's given the bourbon boom is you know, you've got a lot of high quality, you know, one, obviously existing production that's that's been around for a while, but then um, new folks coming to market that um, are really producing amazing spirit. So having had a relationship or knowing uh, David for as long as I have, you know, I was able to watch as, as BBC was developed uh, and then we were able to kind of really work together um, on um, bringing Chicken Cock kind of formally back home uh, to Kentucky. And, you know, the same thing that got me excited about the brand has gotten them excited about the brand, and that's the heritage and being able to do things like go to the Oscar Gets, work with them over there, finding original mash bills, finding, you know, kind of digging into the kind of the archives on the brand and then that's going to be reflected in kind of what we do with BBC in terms of kind of rolling out different types of products, all kind of tying back into the legacy of, of the brand. 
you know, for us having BBC as a partner is is amazing because it really can kind of we can we can go there we can um, you know really call it kind of our home as well and so if we have you know partners in town it's just amazing kind of to be able to show them the whole process of of making top quality bourbon um, and uh, so that's been an important partnership for us. Give me the uh, five and ten year goals going forward. What do you have planned for this brand five ten years out? So in five years we'll have a lot of our own bourbon that will be of age and out in the market. So, um, you know, right now we have approximately, um, let's call it, you know, 1,500 barrels um, between two months old and 11 years old. Um, and on the, the older side, that will be, we'll, we'll have a couple more limited releases um, over the next year, year and a half. And then in Approximately cause just over two years, we'll start bottling um, our own bourbon that we've laid down over the last couple of years. Um, so waiting until it gets to you know at least four years old. Um, and so if we look about five years, that'll be a good chunk of of what we have recently laid down. Um, so as an example, in August we laid down 616 barrels at Bardstown. Um, that will all, all be mature and, and you know, with the goal of having that be bottled um, and in market, um, primarily in the United States. Um, and at the same time, we're starting to develop some partnerships abroad. So I think if we kind of fast forward then 10 years, you know, the goal would be to have a brand that would be, you know, fairly significant in the United States across the country. Uh, as well as in Europe and Asia, where we have some existing business partnerships. Um, but at that point, it'll all be our our own liquid, um, both in the bourbon and also we'll be doing some stuff on the rye um, side, as well as experimenting with different barrel finishes um, and um, you know trying to kind of tap into some of the heritage stuff that's been done with the brand in the past but obviously then having having our spin on it. And we're also looking at the potential of having some additional tasting rooms outside of the Bardstown area. And then global domination from that point, right? <laughs> to a certain extent, yeah. I, well, yeah. I'm a big, big believer in that, um, you know, the future growth of bourbon while, while, you know, will continue to be significant in the United States. I think if you go over to Europe, as an example, there is a lot of enthusiasm for the category, but not a lot of selection. So primarily the bigger brands, not a lot of the small, interesting stuff that you find here. You know, I think that that's where we'll see a lot of growth over the next 10 years, especially um, in Europe as well as in Asia. I mean, we do we have some relationships over there and, and, and the level of enthusiasm is great. And, but unfortunately they can, you know, they basically can get Jack and beam and a couple other brands. So there's a lot of untapped opportunity overseas. So we look at it as our strategy is kind of a dual pronged kind of continue to, to expand in the U S market, um, especially kind of in the near term. And then if we look at a little bit more medium and long term, I think our business will, will continue to grow internationally. In addition to Chicken Cock's 10-year-old double-barrel bourbon, there's Bootlegger's Reserve. It's a blend of bourbon and rye whiskeys and the Heritage Reserve bourbon. That's Whiskey Cast In-Depth, brought to you by Lagavulin, the legendary Isla single malt. Look for the new House Lannister Lagavulin 9-year-old. It's part of the Game of Thrones single malt scotch whiskey collection from Diageo and HBO. You'll find it at a whiskey shop near you. And check out the rest of the Lockaboola and Single Malts at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. Let's start off with the Chicken Cock 10-year-old Double Barrel Bourbon. It's bottled at 52% ABV and was originally distilled at MGP. The nose has notes of old leather, pipe tobacco, caramel candy, subtle fruits, and just a hint of spice. The taste has good spices with a nice sweet base of honey, vanilla, and caramel that do not get overpowered by the spicier touches of pepper, allspice, and ginger, 
along with hints of leather and pipe tobacco in the background. The finish is long, complex, and consistent. I'm scoring it a 93. Now, there's been a lot of talk recently about the demand for so-called club bottlings, single barrels selected by and bottled for whiskey clubs, with some bottles being sold at retail to help keep the costs down. I've had the chance to try three of these club bottlings. First, a special bottle of Uncle Nearest 1856 Tennessee whiskey that was bottled for the British Bourbon Society in London. This one did not actually carry the Uncle Nearest name, though. They labeled it as Nathan Green 1870 Single Barrel in honor of Nearest Green's real name, and 1870 reflects the oldest legal documents found so far that refer to him. This was bottled at 58.35% ABV. The nose has a honey sweetness with charred oak, caramel ice cream topping, muted spices, and just a hint of maple. The taste has great spices with cinnamon, black pepper, and chili powder notes that fade to reveal honey, caramel, and maple for a nice balance and complexity. Water smooths out the spices a bit while not affecting the rest of the flavor. The finish is very long and spicy, and I'm scoring the British Bourbon Society's bottling of Nathan Green 1870's Single Barrel Tennessee Whiskey a 93. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first, our tasting notes are brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. 85 years ago, as the end of Prohibition meant a renewed demand for Kentucky bourbon, Ed Shapira and his brothers invested in a new distillery in Bardstown. They bought out their partners later on, and today that little startup is the largest family-owned and operated distillery. Get the entire history at HeavenHillDistillery.com. Think wisely, drink wisely. Let's get back to the club whiskeys now with one from the Holy Dram Whiskey Club in Israel, which worked with Loch Lomond Distillers to get its hands on a cask of 14-year-old Inchmoan Peated Single Malt. This one is bottled at 52.4% ABV, after being matured in an ex-bourbon hogshead cask, and the club's Gal Granoff indicated that a few bottles of this one might be available still at selected retailers in Europe. The nose has a gentle peatiness with grilled fruits, toasted caramel, butterscotch, and a hint of orange marmalade. The taste is smoky and spicy with a good mix of wood and peat smoke, along with grilled fruits and touches of honey and vanilla. The finish, nice and long, with lingering spices and a hint of campfire smoke. I'm scoring the Holy Dram Whiskey Club's Inchmoan 14-year-old single cask, a 94. Finally, Hemeth Rao of India's Single Malt Amateurs Club arranged to get me a sample of his club's first bottling, the Amrut Amaze. It's bottled at 50% ABV and is described only as multiple cask maturation, no age statement. The nose has notes of orange peel, muted spices, grilled peaches, and a hint of oak. The taste starts off with orange marmalade, followed by an intense blast of white pepper, cardamom, and chili powder. The spices fade to reveal a touch of anise, along with honey and tropical fruits. The finish is long with anise, mango, orange, and lingering spices. There are only 120 bottles of the Single Malt Amateurs Club Amrut Amaze available, and it's a good one. I'm scoring it a 93. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. I'll be adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of more than 2,400 different whiskeys from all over the world. You'll find it at whiskeycast.com. Seven swans a-swimming, six geese a-laying, four calling birds, three French hens, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. All seems a little excessive, doesn't it? When there's one bird they really want this Christmas. Redbreast. The warm glow of ripe fruit, honeyed figs, and crackling cinnamon. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast, and the perfect gift to slip under the tree. 
Let's open up the inbox now for your voice, presented by Lot 40. There are unsung heroes working at every distillery that never get the credit they deserve. The compliance experts that make sure the whiskey makers don't inadvertently make a mistake that leads to problems with the regulators. Well, it turns out they're also helpful when we slip up, too. Amy Bernheisel works in compliance for an unnamed distiller and caught an error in our reporting on the TTB's proposed changes to federal regulations. I mentioned during our first report on the changes earlier this month and in our original story at WhiskeyCast.com that the TTB proposal included expanded tolerance when it comes to bottling strength from the present 0.15% ABV to 0.3% either way. The problem is, I indicated that the current 0.15 standard goes either way, above or below 40%, for instance, and that is wrong. Amy pointed out in her email, quoting now, I've worked at two distilleries and was always told there is no tolerance for overproof bottling. Title 27, Chapter 1, Subchapter A, Part 5, Subpart D, Section 5.37 states allowances for a loss, but nothing for overproof. And Amy's right. The proposal would expand that tolerance to overproof spirits for the first time. Great catch, Amy, and thanks. We also heard from Christina Alexander at K. Perry Alexander on Twitter. She's the general counsel and vice president of compliance at Sagamore Spirit Distillery in Baltimore and tweeted this the other day. The next time I need my team's attention, I'll just ask WhiskeyCast to write about it. Told folks about proposed TTB label regs two weeks ago, and it was radio silence until today. Glad to help, Christina. And for the record, she also referred to them as the hardest working team in the whiskey business. If you have something you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, we'd love to hear from you. Get in touch with us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at WhiskeyCast.com. Your voice is presented by Lot 40, Canada's award-winning 100% pot still rye whiskey. Lot 40, unapologetically Canadian. Please drink responsibly. Let's close things out now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and other things that make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. What is in a name? Well, just ask some of the legendary families of bourbon what's in a name. We heard from Jim Beam's Fred No earlier, or as it says on his birth certificate, Frederick Booker No the Third. Fred's son Freddie is officially Frederick Booker No the Fourth. And this Christmas there's a baby Booker in the family. Frederick Booker No the Fifth was born back on September sixth. And Fred the Third is one proud grandpa. Freddie and his wife Kate decided early on before he was even born that they were going to call him Booker. So I thought well, that's cool. And he's a nice little dude. He doesn't cry a lot. He's, I see a lot of my son in him, and uh, I see a lot of dad at times. He wrinkles his forehead and looks like he says he doesn't have much hair right now. Uh, there's times he resembles my father when I would upset him when I was growing up. No, you never did that. Absolutely. <laughs> All sons do that. What do you mean? <laughs> I've heard you tell the stories, Fred. I'm just pulling your chain there. I know, I know, hey, that's why, but it was, uh, it is funny to watch him and hold him, and he follows voices, it's amazing, he, if Freddie talks, he looks that direction, if I say something, he looks, it makes the women a little upset, that they'll be holding him, and if we get to talking, he wants to be with us more than them, so it's kind of, kind of funny. What kind of Christmas traditions did Booker have? Did he have anything special he did at Christmas time? Now we always cured country hams and, you know, cooked, you know, one of the hams that he uh, cured in the meat house in our backyard. Uh, he liked to make sausage. A lot of it revolved around, 
you know, a meal of some kind, getting friends together and gathering just like most folks, you know, people close, family and friends. That was kind of what he enjoyed more than anything, to hang out, tell stories, listen to what other people had going on for the year and to share a, a little taste of bourbon and, you know, kids. He loved messing with, you know, the young, the young kids, my cousins that were young and uh, I'm sure if he were around, He'd be all over this new grandson. Uh, so I'm sure he's looking down on us, smiling at Christmas this year. It'll be special for, for all of us anyway. Thanks for sharing that with us, Fred. If you have something you'd like us to look into on Behind the Label, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot an 18th century style of premium Irish whiskey, blended from single pot still and single malt. Like yourself, it's one of life's treasured rarities, and what's rare is wonderful. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. That's all for this episode of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you can find our Whiskey Cast HD videos and the Whiskey Cast Tasting Panel podcast, along with the latest whiskey news, events, photos, and a whole lot more, including a complete archive of our past episodes. Remember, friends help friends discover podcasts. Please take a few minutes during the holidays and help your friends out. Show them how to use the podcast app on their smartphone to discover a whole world of free content. It might just be the best gift you can give them. This is whiskey. Johnny Walker's Scotch whiskey. From this place and these people, I, Scotch Makers, creating the bold and complex flavor of Johnny Walker Black Label. Step right up. Whiskey Cast. Brought to you by Redbreast. The definitive single pot still Irish whiskey. Those in the know, no red breast. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2018, and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.